Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's a 10 o'clock clock on a given Thursday. And that means it's uh, talking tax. Uh, we're talking about tax on healthcare today. Welcome to the show, Tom. Thank you for having me on, Jay. So um, the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, it's, not, it's not a nice story about what's happening with tax and, and the healthcare industry. Can you talk about it? Sure. Let me um, uh, kind of give you graphically what the what the problem is. Can we put up the supply and demand graph, please? This, this is a series of projections or actual data points that were collected by the John A. Burns School of Medicine. Uh, they tried to project the demand for physicians in Hawaii against the actual supply. So the demand keeps going up, up, up. The supply kind of, you know, goes in fits and starts and is, is kind of like uh, dropping off. There is now a shortage and the shortage is, is, uh, is likely to get worse uh, before it gets better. Uh, one of the things that the healthcare community has talked about as causing this shortage is general excise tax. Why? Because the general excise tax is imposed on healthcare services. It isn't in most states. And because uh, it's kind of a rare thing, uh, the insurance providers who pay the physicians in most cases, they won't cover it. Medicare won't cover it, Medicaid won't cover it. Uh, and furthermore, they prevent the doctors from surcharging the patient to recover general excise tax. So what's, what's the doc got to do? They have to eat it. Uh, like if, if I were to charge you $100 in legal bills, okay, because I'm a lawyer, uh, I would add 4.712% because I live in Honolulu. You would pay me, assuming you were satisfied with my services, uh, you would pay me uh, 104.71. Uh, I would pay tax on 4.5% uh, of 104.71, which is, which is the total of what you paid to me which happens to be 471, okay? So I would clear $100. That's, that's how the system uh, works right now uh, for most people, you know, including legal providers, grocery stores, drug stores, um, you know, uh, building supply places, you know, laundries, whatever, okay? Most business establishments pass on the 4% tax and then pay the resulting amount to the state. Okay, so okay. it really all it all happens at the consumer level. Right. I build a, I build a consumer. Uh, I wind up paying tax on my re, on my revenue from that consumer, and that's the way that level of the transaction works. Right. But what's the next level? So if um, if I had insurance coverage for some of the expenses. Or, 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 you know, if there was insurance coverage paying it, uh, then I would go to the insurer and say, okay, look, I charged J10471, please pay me. And they would happily cut me a check for 10471. And then everybody's happy. Now, uh, in the healthcare industry, it's not quite the same. Because if I was a doctor and I charged you 10471, uh, Medicare would come back to me and say, well, look, we only, we only allow $100 for this procedure. So we're going to pay you a hundred bucks, and I, and I say, well, what about the four seventy one? And and Medicare would tell me, uh, look, you can't surcharge the patient. That's that's against Medicare rules. So, uh, so I charge you a hundred. I get paid a hundred dollars. I, I have to pay four and a half percent of the hundred dollars to the state, um, leaving me with ninety five fifty. Uh, instead of the hundred dollars that I thought I was going to charge, that's how it works in healthcare. Mm. Yeah, something wrong with that because then what you're doing is you're nicking the doctor for uh, four point seven one, um, and uh, he has no way to recoup that from his patients as every other retail seller in the state can. Right. 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 Well, what about the second level? I was asking about, you know, like, so if I'm selling widgets and I charge my customers 4.71, uh, 
uh, that is one and 4.71. Um, the fellow who sold me the widgets is is wholesale, and he pays what half a percent. That's right. Uh, so for the so, so, so how in, does that in, work now? Sure. Uh, let's say you're a drugstore, uh, and you sell, uh, and and I'm gonna um, give you an example. I mean, you you sell me you sell me some brooms, and I buy a hundred dollars worth of brooms. Okay, the the person that you bought the brooms from. Uh, is going to pay half a percent, not four percent, because you are reselling uh, what you are getting uh, to somebody else. And you and you tell uh, your supplier, "Hey, I'm reselling your merchandise, so you can charge me, uh, or or you can pay tax on only half percent, uh, as opposed to the four or four and a half that's applicable to retail sales." Okay. Generally, the um, the supplier won't know what the heck you're going to do with the brooms, but you fill in the gap by by giving them a piece of paper that say that says I'm reselling the brooms, uh, so you you can get the resale rate. Please rest assured. And okay. then when when it times for the when it comes time for the uh, your supplier to uh, to pass on tax if it chooses to, uh, most suppliers won't pass on uh, more than half a percent. So how does that work in the medical field? Okay, in the medical field, it's very complicated. And let me show you how that works. Let's go to the other uh, chart, um, the, uh, the, the, tax, the tax chart, please. Okay, so uh, what we have is a couple of different situations. Uh, and let me kind of go through uh, go through them in detail. Let's let's go to the bottom chart first. That's kind of what we were just talking about. Um, drug suppliers sell to a retail pharmacy, and because they're selling it, uh, uh, the retail pharmacy is selling those drugs uh, onto the patient. Uh, the drug supplier is entitled to a half percent rate. Now, for some drugs, namely uh, prescription drugs and prosthetic devices. Uh, the legislature has said, well, uh, you know, retail pharmacies, you're exempt. So the, uh, the, the, the amount of tax that the retail pharmacy would pay on this situation is zero. Okay. And the drug supplier still gets the half percent because the retail pharmacy is a licensed reseller uh, with a GET license, and they are reselling uh, the drugs in a retail transaction. That's okay. that's how the, that's how the system works now. Yeah, and the legislature, okay. in its infinite wisdom, made the um, the, the, the the retail uh, transaction exempt. Yes, this was back in 1986. Now, there's a wrinkle to this because uh, hospitals are treated a little bit differently, and let me show you uh, why. Let's let's go to the first part of the same graph. We got that we have a drug supplier selling to a tax exempt hospital uh, that sells to a patient. Now, most hospitals, I think I think all of the hospitals in Hawaii uh, are tax exempt organizations. They're five hundred one c three tax exempt organizations. Okay, and there is law from <coughs> you know a couple of uh, uh, territorial Supreme Court uh, decisions. Uh, decided obviously in the 1940s, uh, which said, okay, if that's the kind of transaction that's going on, yes, we are going to say you, the hospital, are exempt from the 4% tax on your drug sales because you, you, you make those drug sales to provide medical care and medical care is an exempt purpose under the GET law. But we are also gonna consider you an unlicensed seller. So when you buy your drugs from your drug supplier, they're not entitled to the wholesale rate. So the 4% so the rate hops back up uh, to the <coughs> supplier to hospital level. Now, in, in most cases, you don't see that as a problem uh, because drug suppliers typically have special pricing uh, for hospitals known as own use pricing. And then the prices are you know, considerably lower uh, than say what would they, would, they, would, they would sell to a Longs or a Walgreens. 
Well, under under existing law, is the drug supplier paying the the four percent or the half percent? They're supposed to pay four percent under existing law. Are they paying it? Well, I don't know. Okay. I All think right. some so, some are and some aren't. Supposed to pay four percent because the ultimate transaction is tax free. No, because what the, because they're uh, they are selling to uh, an unlicensed seller. Okay, one one of the requirements for the wholesale rate is you have to sell to a licensed seller, and uh, the Supreme Court, in its wisdom, said that if you are selling to a tax exempt organization that resells within the scope of its exemption, then it's not considered a uh, a licensed reseller, and therefore the drug supplier in this case would not be eligible for the wholesale rate. Okay. okay. Because look at the the bottom, uh, the bottom transaction, uh, the retail pharmacy uh, does not pay four percent excise tax, and the and the drug supplier still gets the half percent rate. Okay, got it. Okay, so it's I I, I didn't say it was going to be easy. Okay, this is a complicated area, but but again, you've got you know at least a couple of decisions of the territorial supreme court that we made in the nineteen forties that give us this result. Does it make sense? Maybe not, especially in light of today's conditions. Uh, so, you know. What effect does it have on today's conditions? Well, the, the doctors are certainly complaining about it. They, they, they wind up eating the 4%. They, they, they wind up eating the 4% uh, because we know wherever it's applied because, because Medicare uh, and Medicaid say, we ain't paying for no tax. We just give you a, a certain amount of dollar, certain dollar amount for the procedure based on what the diagnostic code is. And this is all you get, period. Okay. End of story. Yep. So is there, is there an indication that doctors are leaving town because of that? I know there are other factors that would make them leave town. But is, is this, do they oppose this? Uh, do they complain about it? Yes, they um, do. What's the process? Do you, what they, do you they, they've been they've been complaining about it for the last fifteen years. Okay. And uh, and yet, uh, this this the system still you know still happens. Uh, and there is uh, you know as we were talking a little bit before the show, there is a bill in the legislature that would make things worse. Uh, there's a bill called Senate Bill 2020, which is. Um, uh, and there's, there's a House companion. Uh, let me see if I can pull up that number. House Bill 1407. Both of them, I believe, are still alive. And they would say, okay, uh, in either of these scenarios, okay, you need uh, a a four percent rate to qualify the previous rate for it, previous leg for wholesale. So, if this bill passes. Uh, in the scenarios that we we talked about earlier, um, the drug the drug supplier would pay four percent in both scenarios, both when they sell to a tax exempt hospital and when they sell to a retail pharmacy. And and it would have I think broader implications than that because, you know, let's say you have uh, somebody who imports supplies and then manufactures them into parts. Those parts go into a you know, sub-assembly of another device, those parts go into a sub-assembly sub, sub of another device, and they go into a bigger device. Okay, so you have, you know, four or five uh, levels of manufacturer to get a, a certain device. And if, if it's all done in Hawaii, uh, it goes, you know, through the tax system, you know, four or five times. Okay, under current law, Everything except the final leg is at half percent. If the bill passes, every other leg is going to be four percent. So you might you might see four percent popping up two or three times. Um, who put this in? We don't know. Is but somebody who wants to have a tax increase. No? Yeah, um, we we suspect that's the department. Uh, you know, the tax department's official bills 
supposed to go through the governor's package, but I think there are a couple that didn't. Uh, you know, we 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 do know that the that the tax director has some friends in the legislature, and you know they may uh, have been persuaded to introduce uh, you know a couple of uh, tax bills for their old buddy. Okay, uh, we don't know if that's the you know if that's true or not. That's just a rumor I've heard. Um, but you know, with the degree of sophistication of tax bills like this one, it it seems to be you know, uh, kind of above the pay grade of most legislators. So who's uh, supporting it? Who's who's pushing to, you know, I guess it's still alive. Who's pushing to have it passed? And who's opposing it? Uh, the department's pushing it. They say, they say, they say they're in strong support. Uh, we've provided comments as usual. Uh, the hospitals are opposing it tooth and nail, saying that it would increase you know, the cost of health care by millions. Um, well, and so and so we've have, you know, we have this kind of fight brewing, but, you know, again, uh, because the administration or because the department uh, is pushing this, uh, it looks like the bill is still moving. Um, do, do we need a tax increase? And do we need a tax increase on health care? You're a fiscal uh, person. You look at public policy in broad terms. Do we? Do we need that? We need another tax increase like a hole in the head, especially in times like this when we got a budget surplus. We have all kinds of federal aid money coming into, you know, into our state. Uh, Grassroot Institute has estimated that we have a $3 billion budget surplus. $3 billion. That's That's more than chump change. No, oh, and we, we just gave 600 million to the Hawaiian homelands. Well, that's, um, that's, that's not a done deal yet. Oh, okay, okay, thank you for that. Yeah, no, uh, no, nothing's, nothing's over until the, uh, until the final gavel. But you know, let me say that it happen. just seems, this year it seems to be burning a hole in our pockets, no? It's looked like they're looking for ways to spend it this year. Oh same. yeah, a, a lot. A lot of the legislators are are up for re-election. Okay, they want to make an impact, and they want to make an impact this year. So you know, how how can they do that by, you know, by spending it on things that are close to you know close to their hearts or their constituents' hearts? You know, one of the things that's come up uh, since the last time we spoke. Well, maybe we touched on it then. Is uh, this whole thing about credibility of the legislature, and of course, it, it's it, it driven off the um, revelations over um, uh, corruption and and bribery. Um, but where where do we stand on that now? I mean, if if you don't have the level of confidence, trust, and confidence that you maybe one at one time we did have in the legislature, how do you see these things? And maybe you look at every bill differently. Do you look at every bill differently now? Uh, well, we don't. I mean, we we you know typically look at these from a tax and public policy perspectives, but um, but rumors are going around uh, that you know because Senator English and um, uh, Representative uh, Cullen were charged by information rather than by indictment, uh, the rumor is well, there's more coming. And um, I think, you know, most legislators uh, um, either, you know, I mean, even if they don't have anything to, to, to really be worried about, they'd be more careful. And the, uh, and the legislators who do have, you know, something to be worried about would be very careful. Hmm. I have a question for you. Sure. What's the question? If the, the tax hits every level of subassembly in Hawaii, wouldn't this incentivize what few manufacturers we have left to offshore their production to the mainland or elsewhere? Oh, yeah, doesn't, absolutely. Doesn't this hurt virtual, virtually integrated businesses? Yeah, vertically integrated businesses would suffer the most. Um, manufacturers would suffer a lot because they have to go through several different production stages. Um, 
Well, actually, uh, if it, it actually it would help vertically integrated businesses because if a, a manufacturing operation does several several stages in house, okay, then they would they would avoid uh, the different four percent layers uh, that are incident to. Um, you know, having you know A sell to B, B sell to C, C sell to D, and so forth. If A does, you know, these uh, C's and these function it, it itself uh, with its with its own employees, then uh, it, then it can, it can avoid those multiple layers attacks. So it incentivize a, a company that was involved in a, a, a vertical chain of production to acquire um, organizations uh, that it was ordinarily dealing with as separate organizations, make it all one big organization. And that way you don't have to pay tax on what you're doing in-house. Right. Is that, or, is or, that or possible? You would... is that, is that, that's not easy to do, is it? Well, it depends on the kind of, uh, of manufacturer you are and, and where your supplies are. Um, if, for example, you're a coffee grower uh, and, you need, and you need Hawaii's climate, then you know, you, you can only outsource so much because you got to grow the coffee here. Well, it strikes me, let me pose it to you, you know, that that beneficial possibility, that is of not having to pay tax on intramural, you know, production and transfer in a given single company. That's a benefit for that company. And it encourages acquisition, I suppose. And yeah, it, it encourages bigger companies. Yeah, uh, which which may or may not be easy to do because uh, you need money to do that. Right. Uh, um, but the other the other uh, possibility, which is seems to me pretty detrimental, is you're raising you're raising the level of tax between all the component companies, however many there are, and where you were getting half percent on maybe a number of companies, now you're multiplying that by eight. Um, at least eight. Um, yeah, on, so, on so that's all the various steps in, in the in the assembly. That's right. A so lot, that's why we're a saying, lot of extra tax imposed on tax. manufacturing and and for that matter the entire economy. Yeah, and that's what we're trying to say. Uh, you know, to to lawmakers that this is going to be one of the effects of that bill if it passes. So uh, you know, we're very concerned about it. And that would outweigh the benefits, if you call them benefits, of um, the fact that you you know you can avoid the tax by acquiring, merging with uh, other companies in the assembly process, right? Or, or by that's a small it. benefit against a huge detriment. Yeah, or or by outsourcing it. You know, uh, it's, uh, for a lot of people, it's easier to outsource. Mm -hmm. uh, outsource out the outside the state. Yeah, S sending our economic activity away that's right yeah so this this goes to something i'm sure that you and the tax foundation think about all the time um that is and we you and i have talked about this many times and that is tax is an enormously powerful uh member of the toolkit in the in our inventory at at, at moderating the economy at encouraging the economy at shaping the economy and various sectors in the economy. And one would think, recognizing that, that's economics 101 or high school economics, um, one would think there would be a comprehensive tax plan and policy to shape and improve the economy of Hawaii. Uh, where can I find that plan, Tom? Well, there isn't one. I mean, the, uh, the the tax review commission, which has just rendered its report uh, earlier this year, uh, was supposed to do something like that. I mean, its 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 job is to uh, render um, you know opinions on the the tax system as a whole. Uh, but they didn't do that. They they just gave us some suggestions for raising taxes, like hey, let's adopt a carbon tax. Hey, let's look at a tourist green fee. You know, stuff like that. Um, uh, maybe it, it addresses revenue adequacy if they're thinking, well, the state government's not getting enough money, so 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 they have to whack us some more. Uh, but I don't think that's the job. 
uh, the well, obviously uh, there, there are different opinions on that and the existing members of the tax review commission that, you know figured their job was otherwise well the other the other part of this which is central in our discussion today is health care so if i make the conclusion and i think from the media over the past 20 years we can make the conclusion that we have a doctor train in hawaii we have a health care problem in hawaii uh, um, then presumably we would have a plan, a plan to minimize the departure of doctors, to maximize the medical services available to the citizens of the state, um, to protect and preserve, you know, what we have and to improve it. Um, so I guess I'll ask you the same question. Where can I look up that plan? There isn't one. Oh. That's okay. I mean, supposedly, supposedly that's why we elect lawmakers, you know, to come up with that kind of thinking and then put it into action. So um, maybe, you know, uh, maybe it's an argument for getting different lawmakers. Yeah, it, it certainly sounds like that. Um, the other thing is, um, let's, let's look at the legislature for a minute. If I ask you um, where these thoughts should properly, you know, be initiated. That is, um, you know, planning for the economy, um, you know, reports, inquiries, um, recommendations. Where where should that be coming from within state government? Is this something that DBED, the Department of Business and Economic Development and Tourism, should be generating? And if so, to what committees in the state legislature should that go? And what committees in the legislature should be addressing you know, the problems and the plan and, you know, the ultimate massaging of the economy. Sure. Um, the uh, DBED uh, does have um, assets to address that. Uh, they have uh, a bunch of economists. Uh, they are uh, supposed to be concerned with uh, economic development. Uh, my, course, my observation is they write reports reporting the status of the economy. That's not the report I'm talking about, though. Right. The report I'm talking about is uh, going further than just reporting on the status of the economy. It's what a better economy would look like and how you get there. Well, that's political leadership. And um, that should be coming from the top. Become from the governor's office, and then from there, perhaps to the <coughs> economic development committees of the House and Senate, then to the money committees, uh, and then you know hopefully they, they come up with good laws. So the the bill you're talking about, the very troublesome bill about the gross excise tax, you know, did that come from the economic development committees of either the House or the Senate? Did it come from DBED? Did it come from the governor? Uh, well, let's see. Uh, the Senate bill was introduced by Senator Kyo, Kyoho Kalole. It went to the uh, Ways and Means Committee directly, which is their money committee. The House bill went to, I believe, the Economic Development Committee. Uh, it was introduced by uh, Ryan Nimani, who um, I believe heads the, uh, 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 the Human Services um, Committee. And then it uh, is now pending in, oh, it went through the, I'm sorry, the, it was referred to the, uh, it was referred to this uh, Consumer Protection Committee, but um, that referral got canceled. So, it's not, so now it's going to finance, uh, which is Sylvia Luke's committee. It was a bill that we're talking about, a part of a plan or just a, a standalone? Standalone. It's a problem. Let me go to the question of health care. So um, what are the committees, who are the agencies that would address the preservation of our health care industry and health care services for the public? Where well, should I, that come from? Uh, I, I believe Department of Health has some responsibility, Department of Human Services, uh, because they administer Medicaid. Um, the uh, there are health committees in both the House and Senate, and then the, the money committees would get involved as well. Okay, so 
Did these bills go through those committees? Uh, this particular one didn't. So they don't have the benefit of whatever expertise exists on those com those committees. No. no, that's correct. So what what does this all teach us? I mean, just to, just to sort of summarize a little bit, um, that these bills um, are, are really out of um, they're out of, out of the blue. Uh, they're, they look like they're just intended to raise money. They they they, do, they don't necessarily look at how, the impact they will have on on state health services or on the state economy. Um, yeah, that, that's how <clears throat> that's how most bills come in. Uh, they're 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 one shot affairs. Um, they're introduced by an individual legislator or, you know, sometimes more than one. Uh, they're they're uh, introduced to address a specific constituent concern, and the idea is that the uh, you know the bills go in. Uh, they they may start off as one shots, but they may you know be combined with other things. They may be amended uh, as the discussion on the topic uh, goes on and through the various committees to which it's been assigned. Is that, is that good? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's good or bad, but it's typical. Is typical good? I mean, we're, we're examining this because we, you know, there are questions that the media has raised over trust and confidence in the legislature. And, um, you know, we saw the Supreme Court knock down gut and replace uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and and the, uh, the media coverage of that said, well, okay, that's one. That's one problem. Gut and replace was one problem, but it will need further litigation. It will need further correction by statute and otherwise before we can feel that the kind of abuse that was represented in gut and replace can be corrected. I mean, such as, for example, uh, the way the conference committees work at the end where bills uh, come and go without any explanation. Um, so where are we in this? Uh, these, these bills are emblematic, it seems to me, uh, of a lack of uh, comprehensive analysis and concern uh, for the future of the state. And they represent the, um, the wishes and will of a few constituents, um, but nobody's actually watching the larger picture, the store, so to speak. Am I right about that? What are your feelings about that? Well, I mean, I, I think that there are lots of people trying to watch the store. Um, the, the money committees, for example, are uh, you know, they have to deal with the budget and, and uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of bills. So they're in a position to kind of coordinate what's going to go through and what's going to get, get, get stopped and, and uh, you know, tossed to the cutting room floor. Um, and, you know, that's the kind of government system we have. And, you know, it really, it does have the potential to work. We just have to uh, have the elements, um, you know, cleaned up once in a while. And, and hopefully this corruption... Uh, scandal will lead to a little bit more cleaning up of what we got in there. Well, we have a, a gubernatorial election coming up not too not too far. Well, we have and, an election for everybody. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Let, let's make you a, a candidate. I mean, a hypothetical candidate. Um, what 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 platform point would you take? What would you say to the people you want? to vote for you about what bills, what initiatives could be brought into play to make this, um, make this work better and make, make the public more confident of the system? Well, I think it's important for the, uh, you know, for the lawmakers to understand that they have to be responsive to the, to the, you know, the concerns of the broader public, um, that we've got a big health crisis and that, uh, you know, we got we got doctors already heading for the exits. I mean, like regular people too, but 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 doctors heading for the exits at a time when you, when we need them, right? I mean, who who can who can be you know in the middle of a pandemic without doctors, right? So uh, we 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 need to, I think, look even at that sector of the of the economy uh, as not oh you know uh, uh, these are rich fat cats that get dumped that can get dumped on, uh, but you know, hey, if we need them, we better start treating them with respect and, and, not, and not, you know, dumping on them at every, at every opportunity. So we, we, yeah, I mean, government needs, you know, some money to, to live on. So, so we have to have some taxes, but, um, 
we you know we don't want to see more than more than necessary and we want to see good controls on what's you know what's there 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 are a lot of uh, uh you know fiscal gimmicks uh, that have been developed over the years and you know a lot of them are still in use like special funds um to reduce transparency to uh you know, to get rid of the public in the decision making process uh the, the the conference committee rule with uh you know no public input is also another you know tough thing um you know, maybe maybe that ought to be relooked at so uh you know so 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 as to increase transparency at that stage as well you know it strikes me there are a lot of lobbyists uh, and um, uh, special uh, constituents that try to have the maximum effect on a given bill but when you take for example the tax foundation of hawaii uh, or an organization like common cause which is a nonprofit, which appears on these bills um and they, and they more than more than a um you know a, a business organization that is a constituent seeking a particular agenda um they that is the nonprofits um they they um represent the public or at least their view of what the public should have are they getting an appropriate hearing uh, is the Tax Foundation, Common Cause, and all the others, are they getting an appropriate hearing in the ledge? Or is it mm, the same kind of hearing that a business organization with a specific business agenda gets? More or well, less or the same? Well, well, I think you know they're listening to nonprofits more now. Um uh, they're, they're, when the when the um uh, decision on on gut and replace came out. Uh, you know there were there were prior decisions on it too. Um, when, when the tax foundation versus state decision came out, uh, you, you know we, uh, we we might not have realized it at the time because we lost the case. But it, it, it was uh, that decision made it much easier for nonprofits like ours to get into court and uh, and sue people for over uh, things that would be. Uh, objectionable to our constituents. Okay, uh, there was a, there was a a, a, tax, a, a bill uh, that was you know championed by the speaker's office and put in the legislature the, the very next session, uh, seeking to reverse the the um, the result of that case. You know, I and other nonprofits uh, you know testified uh, that that would basically squish the the, the nonprofit sector, and and legislators listened. I mean, it was kind of the one of the one of the rare um, uh, instances when the Tax Foundation and other very, you know, um, right-leaning organizations, I mean, uh, left-leaning organizations were on the same page. And and a number of legislators kind of remarked on that. I mean, yeah, you you guys are taking the same position. I mean, that, that's that's very rare. And I said, I said, well, that that's because it's what it is, Representative. Mm. Well, you know, one thing is you, you talk about all this litigation and this, so it, it, it establishes a kind of um, interaction between the courts and the legislature on on policy uh, and and respecting these um, nonprofit cause organizations. It's, it seems to me, though, that be, because what you're also saying implicitly is that if you have to go to court to be heard, if you have to go to court to get your views understood and respected that's a flaw uh, it's obviously better not to have to go to court uh, it's better that you should you know receive the kind of respect that a nonprofit bent on representing the public uh, should get and then you wouldn't have to go to court much at all would you yeah but but the reality is that there's you know dozens and dozens of nonprofits representing all kinds of causes and if you're a legislator who do you listen to right I mean, you, you got to You got to uh, listen to somebody who is giving you credible advice, uh, who is you know telling it like it is, to, who is who is nonpartisan, uh, and 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 telling you the you know the facts and the truth, as opposed to you know what somebody you know might want. Fair enough. Uh, Tom Yamachika, president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Very interesting discussion. Um, not 
without complexity, but nevertheless very important because tax and tax legislation always has an effect. And sometimes we see it right away and sometimes we find out the hard way. Uh, thank you so much, Tom. Thanks for having me on the show, Jay. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.